This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. Okay, so yours truly, Leonard French, has been fighting a company called Malibu Media since they started suing people. They started suing people in around 2012, or maybe it was the beginning of 2013 or something. And Judge Michael Bailson of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania selected five defendants who had opposed Malibu Media's subpoenas for their identities from their internet service providers. Michael Bailson selected five of them to go to court and, and fight Malibu Media. And I was fresh out of law school and I advertised for and received actually two clients from that matter, but I didn't want to represent two clients in my very first trial. So I actually passed the second, I referred the second client to a different attorney. And the five defense attorneys represented the five defendants in the very first Malibu media litigation that went to some kind of trial. And it's kind of hard for me to say that that's a trial because there really wasn't much of a trial by the time we got to it. It was not what I would call a contested hearing or a contested trial where I had to present evidence and cross-examine witnesses in front of a judge or jury. No, I stood there in the background still with the other five defense attorneys, but I stood there, you know, keeping myself quiet because we had settled the case by then. The defendant I was representing kept their anonymity, settled their case for an amount they could afford, can't talk about it more than that, and was allowed to go uh, f fulfill their service in the United States military, which had been pending during the case. So my client didn't get off scot-free or anything, but they, they did end up settling their case. And part of the settlement was that they had to admit their liability. Uh, why? I can't go into all that. That's client confidential. But what we did get was a ruling from the judge that if my client had not settled the case, they would have been hit with $2,250 per title. That was the that was the major threat. We didn't even have that number yet, so we were concerned it would have been even higher. Uh, the judge found only two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars, which is three times the minimum. The three times is a normal number. You triple damages when intentions or or when infringements are willful or intentional. So it's a standard number now to have $2,250 per title as your copyright statutory damages for downloading something from BitTorrent. And that doesn't even include the fact that BitTorrent shares as it downloads, and that's some kind of contributory and maybe even some kind of vicarious liability. I don't think that anyone who doesn't have knowledge is vicariously liable. Vicarious liability would be like if the subscriber got charged for the copyright infringement of a subscribee, of a internet user that they paid for the internet. Well, it would only really work that way if they knew about the infringements and condoned the infringements and didn't do anything about it. The subscriber might get a vicarious liability charge or, or claim. A contributory liability claim is the one where you share something without permission as opposed to just downloading it. Well, BitTorrent does both. Well, this company, Malibu Media, does not sue people for contributory infringement anymore, at least not that I've seen, but instead sues people for direct infringement in a John Doe lawsuit, and they then pursue a subpoena to the ISP for the subscriber's identity, and then from there they purport to want to go after the actual infringer. Instead, a lot of these cases play out uh, much differently. The vast difference in power and resources between a large law firm and their large client versus any, any one individual internet subscriber is it's the, the, the difference is so large that the subscriber often wants to settle the case even if they're innocent. And Malibu Media doesn't want to settle the case for nothing. They want to settle the case for money. And I'm not allowed to talk about how much money, but there's money on the table. 
And if every infringement is worth $2,250, you can imagine that the demands can be high. What has happened then is the company, Malibu Media, has, has sort of had a colorful or checkered past because of all this shenaniganery, as I'll call it. Their first, they, they, they had to sue their first law firm, Keith Lipscomb, alleging that there never was a representation agreement in writing and that they hadn't been receiving the proceeds of litigation. Then they sued or were sued by the next law firm, the Pilar Law Firm, and I forget the circumstances under which that happened. Uh, maybe we can find an article or something to put up on the screen while I talk under it. And then they sort of stopped filing lawsuits last August, and they filed like one or two more, but they haven't really filed too many since then. And we heard that they had been sued by their investors and sued by their current law firm. And so what we're looking at here, after how many minutes of background material to get there, the Lomitzer Law Firm has sued Malibu Media in West Palm Beach, Florida, and it goes like this. The firm provided legal services to Malibu commencing on or about May 26, 2017, so two and a half years ago, pursuant to a representation agreement, including coordinating litigation on behalf of Malibu on a nationwide basis, receiving the settlements of such litigation, depositing such settlements into the firm's trust account, paying court filing fees, process server fees, investigators fees, and the expense in connection with the depositions of Malibu. The firm issues invoices to Malibu on a regular basis for services provided to Malibu under the agreement, paid some of the firm's invoices from the monies deposited into the firm's trust accounts, and remitted monies from the firm's trust account to Malibu. This is normal. That's how you're supposed to do it. They might be, they might be conducting a copyright uh, shakedown or extortion scheme, in my opinion, but what the firm is supposed to do with their money is have an agreement as to how the money is going to be handled. And when you bill your customer, when you bill your client as an attorney, so if I send somebody, if I, if I do the work for $1,000 and I get, and I have incurred a $1,000 bill and my client now owes me $1,000, well, I might have the client's money in my trust account because that's what we do, I ask for the money up front. So I now have the money under my control, but it's not in my account. So in order to cross the legal threshold of taking their money out of the trust account and putting it into my firm's account or my personal account, I have to have earned the money, I have to invoice them, and then they have to not dispute the invoice. If they dispute the invoice that I'm supposed to put the money back into the trust account, even if I'm not happy about the dispute, and and then that money stays in the trust account until the dispute is, is settled, and then I can take the money back out or whatever happens after the dispute is settled. So that's what they're saying, sort of setting up here, is that they're handling the money properly. But on or about October 31st, 2018, the firm and Malibu entered into an addendum reflecting, among other things, the frequency of invoices to Malibu, the maximum amount of services to be invoiced each month, and the frequency of payments of the firm's invoices. The agreement or addendum provided that the firm and Malibu each had the right to terminate the relationship with 30 days notice. Beginning at a date presently unknown, Malibu began a program of circumventing the agreement and the addendum, and the relationship between the firm and Malibu. Beginning at a date presently unknown, Malibu instructed attorneys in various jurisdictions that were representing Malibu in the nationwide litigation that was being coordinated by the firm. They instructed them to bypass the firm and remit settlement monies from such litigation other than to the firm, while still expecting the firm to pay court filing fees, process server fees, all incurred for and on behalf of and for the benefit of Malibu. Then, on August 30th, 2019, the firm terminated its representation of Malibu. Now, I can't speak to my personal knowledge of that. I do have personal knowledge of what, what I was asked to do at that time. And what the allegations say is happening is the client, 
told their local attorneys in various jurisdictions to start having money sent directly to Malibu Media instead of to the Lomitzer Law Firm. And therefore, the Lomitzer Law Firm didn't receive the monies to then use for further litigation and further costs and everything. And then the firm, Lomnitzer Law Firm, terminated its representation of Malibu for that sort of bypassing of the thing. And so they're suing now. Lomnitzer Law Firm is suing their client. By the way, there are lots of insurance companies that don't like it when you sue clients. So Lomnitzer will now have to explain to, likely have to explain to their insurers at some point, either when they renew their insurance or something, why they are suing their client. So they say, or various invoices, as of December 31st, 2019, here we get some actual numbers, the firm has $57,451.20 in its trust account on behalf of Malibu Media. Subsequent to December 31st, the firm received an additional $416.67, don't know how they got there, which has been deposited into its trust account Thus, the total of the firm's trust accounts as of the date of filing is $58,867.87. But the firm has issued invoices to Malibu of $262,549.92 that are currently open and unpaid. The agreements provide that the firm shall have a charging lien against any financial recovery as a result of the firm's representation. As of the date of filing this complaint, Malibu has not disputed any of the firm's explanations as to the amount owed or justified Malibu's attempts to avoid payment of the firm's invoices by having settlements bypass the firm. So they're asking for judgment and interest and a lien against for the proceeds of any pending litigation. So that's really interesting. They kind of got what was coming to them when you when you take on this kind of, uh, you know, on the line litigation. Do you really expect that your client is not also going to be operating on the line with you? It's not that Lomnitzer or any one attorney deserves ever to have a client screw them out of their money, but it's more like we always have to consider that these sorts of disagreements can arise and clients might just not pay. So how do you protect yourself? You have to protect yourself by getting the money up front, usually. Rule number one is get cash up front. The other way of saying Foonbridge rule is just three words. Three magic words. Cash up front. That's how you distinguish the clients who can pay from the clients who can't pay and won't pay. The client who can't or won't pay you money at the beginning of the case is the same client who can't or won't pay you money at the end of the case. That's uh, Professor Jay Foonberg's law in his book, How to Start and Build a Law Practice. I'll link to that on our Amazon Associates account in the description. So that's what they did here. They tried to get the money up front by getting the money from the litigation sent directly to the Lomitzer law firm, according to this lawsuit. And then the client went and bypassed that and had the money sent directly to the client so that the client could collect the money and not have to pay the law firm, it appears. Allegedly. 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 So, okay. Now, Tack, what do we have about a second lawsuit? Do we have something about a second lawsuit, I think you said? Over the summer, there was a, uh, a lawsuit. So it actually predates this lawsuit. And it was okay. by investors in Malibu Media who had um, what, what seems like they had put up a lump sum to help finance this uh, copyright litigation money-making strategy. And wow. they claim that they have not received uh, the dividends from that investment. Although we knew of the story over the summer, because it was filed in state court, um, it was very difficult to get a hold of the documents. But yeah. the Hollywood Reporter, bless them, has provided the, uh, the original complaint. Uh, so that is in the folder for you. Which we are looking at now. This is Genova Capital and Warm Blood suing defendants Colette Pelessier, or Pelessier, Colette Pelessier Field, which is her married name, 
Brigham Field, which is her husband and photographer producer, Malibu Media LLC, Click Here LLC, and then take a look at how they've organized themselves here. Colette Holdings LLC, Colette Properties LLC, Colette Production Inc., Colette Productions Inc., and ZO Digital LLC, and Doe's 1 to 25. And this is for breach of oral and written contract. Over the last two and a half years, plaintiffs and defendants have entered into a number of oral and written agreements regarding money that plaintiffs either loaned to defendants via promissory notes secured with deeds of trust on real property owned by defendants, or invested in exchange for 50% interest in copyrights owned by Malibu Media, and a 50% interest in the money generated by the protection of these copyrights. So they're, wait a second. So they had an investment firm take an interest. So this is litigation finance. I'm literally getting messages about litigation finance on the daily because it is such a hot topic in law right now. So this company financed their litigation in return for 50% of the money. Do you think that that would encourage a plaintiff to demand more money so that they would get more for themselves since they're only getting 50% of it? Hmm. Or advanced to a law firm to clear title to certain real property owned by defendants. So, so they also had real property, as in like real estate. They also had like buildings and land or something tied up in this deal. And they have been loaned, invested, or advanced $3 million. Wait a second. Why do they need $3 million? They're a rich adult entertainment company who makes some of the most popular adult entertainment in the world, and they're suing people who are sharing their things, their, their videos online, and yet they still need more money? I, I have a feeling someone has, has, that there's something more going on here. On information and belief, Malibu, a subscription-based adult entertainment company, has made and continues to make money from the use, license, or sale of its copyrights or from its copyright protection efforts. However, defendants' high-end lifestyle has begun to outstrip their business income. Defendants have defaulted on the two promissory notes and have not repaid to Genova Capital the legal fees and costs they advanced on behalf of the defendants. What? I did not read this before. What did I just say? Oh my goodness. Defendants have also not paid 50% of the money that has been generated from the use, license, or sale of the copyrights, nor 50% of the net recovery from the copyright protection efforts. So according to this, they kept all the money that they were, that they were uh, uh, receiving from copyright enforcement efforts. I'll use their terms. Allegedly. Genova Capital is currently pursuing a non-judicial, which means out of court, foreclosure on the promissory notes, so kind of like foreclosing on real estate. The remaining advanced monies and monies owed to them on the use, sale, license of the copyrights and protection efforts are the subject of this lawsuit. Let's see. On, be, on information and belief, non-party Pilar Law Group spearheaded the copyright protection efforts on behalf of Malibu between 2012 and late 2017. Wait, that was also Keith Lipscomb, so I wonder if Pilar Law Group was actually behind the Keith Lipscomb efforts that I was, in, that I was defending against in 2012. Lori Lomnitzer is a Florida barred attorney who works at the Lomnitzer Law Firm, and they are currently are currently spearheading, not anymore, right? They were currently spearheading the copyright protection efforts on behalf of Malibu Media. There's another attorney in New Jersey who is the managing partner of Dakotis, Dakotis, Fitzpatrick, Colin Giblin. They are connected to Lomnitzer and Malibu. Uh, they receive a percentage of the profits from the copyright protection efforts or a monthly fee uh, for their role in establishing the relationship with Malibu. And then there's those 1 to 25 who they're trying to figure out who they are. Let's see what the general allegations say. Defendants owe Genova Capital over $2.89 million on two promissory notes. The first note is for $2.5 November 28, 2016, 
It's executed by Colette Palacier and Brigham Field in favor of Genova, secured by a deed of trust on a Malibu home. I mean, they're literally from Malibu, California, which is owned by Palacier and Field. Defendants needed the $2.5 million so that they could pay an already existing loan to a third party that was, at that point in time, coming due. I, I'm looking forward to the day when I can just go to a capital company and just get $2.5 million to pay off my other loan so that I don't have to pay it. And then somehow not, well, I, I would never screw anybody out of money. I don't understand how having that amount of money enables these people to get away with these kinds of things. Meanwhile, between February 2017 and 2019, checks from a variety of bank accounts that belong to Field Plessier, Colette Productions Inc., Colette Productions LLC, Colette Properties, and Zio Digital were issued as payments on this $2.5 million note. The first promissory note came due January 1st, 2018. They are now in default of this note. The total due as of March 2019 with interest was $2,744,206.67. The second promissory note was April 11, 2017 for $125,000. is also secured by a deed of trust on the home. Defendants needed this money to repay a loan that had been taken out from a company called Everest, which we all know now is pronounced Everest, right? Also, on information and belief, Pulisier and Field gave the $125,000 to Everest so that they could gain or regain control of Malibu Media. No payments have been made towards this note, and they are in default of the note now worth $146,198.62. So July 2017, they requested Genova Capital's assistance with a dispute regarding the ownership of certain real property at this Elise property uh, on Elise Street in, or Ellis Street, I don't know how it's pronounced, in Malibu, California. Let's see, let's look up this address, because this is a business address, right? So let's, let's take a look at what this uh, property is. Oh wait, there's two of them, 11824 and 11802. Let's take a look at them on Google. Or actually, no, let's look on them on Zillow. How about that? Uh, so this is just a piece of land, it looks like. Uh, it does not have, there we go. Foreclosure auction, <laughs> $4.359 million. Holy mackerel. So the loans were issued for $5.5 million. Then they were in default, 4.299 past due, and now there's a foreclosure auction. There's been a notice of sale, was scheduled to be sold at a foreclosure auction, but they are often postponed. So I don't know if it's actually been sold. They say it's actually only worth 2.2 million. So I don't know how they're getting 4.3 for it, but that sounds like someone's not making a very good decision. But hey, I don't know how this works. So let's see the history here. Listings removed at 7.5, sold at 7 million, and then listed for sale at 7.5 again, but then listing removed at 6. Well, that's interesting. This one is a home worth $17 million. Holy mackerel. Let's see. You need to make $80,000 a month to buy this house. You need to pay $80,000 a month to buy this house, by the way. This looks, this looks a little wrong, doesn't it? Listing for $18 million, then listed for $50,000, then sold for $160,000. I'm betting that has something to do with the, with the shenaniganery going on here. A $17 million home being sold for $160,000. Uh, I don't, I don't even want to start to speculate what the heck is going on there. Somebody who knows how real estate works and how evading things works. I'm not saying anyone's evading anything that hasn't been said in these documents, but you know, with all this shenaniganery going on, I wonder what the heck a $160,000 sale of a hundred of a $17 million house means. They can't tell who owns it. They think it's Colette Properties. Genova Capital advanced the legal fees and costs to recover the property on behalf of defendants who in turn agreed to pay. This is for the uh, 11824, which is the empty property. Let's see, Mike, some, uh, a law firm named Michael Min and Robinson filed a complaint against certain defendants to quiet title. Quiet title is when there's a dispute over 
the titles and liens and ownership of a property, so a quiet title action would be to get all that eliminated so that the title is now clean and free and clear and can be can be sold without the buyer wondering what they're buying. Genova Capital paid Michael Sin and Robinson $7,000 for their legal work. I'd like to see this $167,000 number come up here. So then they invested $400,000 into Malibu Media in exchange for 50% of the copyrights and copyright protection efforts. They were going to split 50-50 the net recoveries generated from protecting the copyrights. And they agreed to deliver accountings to the investors prior to each month profit distribution. Wow. Okay, here we get some real numbers. On information and belief between 2012 and 2018, the copyright protection efforts generated over $26.5 million. In 2018 alone, the copyright protection efforts generated over $2.8 million. So if you ever wonder why they conduct this kind of copyright enforcement scheme, which I like to call a shakedown scheme or legalized extortion, but all based on copyright statutory damages, they raised what appears to be almost $30 million. And then somehow can't pay for anything. I, I, I don't, I, what? Since executing the consulting agreement, the efforts have continued. The defendants have received funds from that effort, 50% of which belongs to the investors. However, not a single cent has been deposited in the investor's account, nor have they otherwise received any money. They have not received any money from the use, license, or sale of Malibu Media's copyrights. Now, on one hand, don't you think they get what they deserve? I mean, look what they're investing in. They're investing in a very unpopular copyright trolling scheme where the plaintiffs go after people even when they say they won't. We've had them go after people like war veterans, poor people, where Colette said on the record in a, you know, pun punishable by perjury declaration that they don't go after these people, and then yet they do. And then here's additional information. Uh, this is going to be super interesting. This is going to give us the history of Malibu Media's trolling efforts, I think. Palesier and Field started Malibu Media in 2009. They run the subscription-based adult entertainment site x-art.com. They operate the business primarily from the houses she shares with Field. They're literally shooting all of these things in their own house. Field has a prominent role in the business, including being a manager and the sole agent for service of process for the company. Starting in approximately 2012, Malibu initiated copyright lawsuits on a nationwide basis against people they accused of stealing films from the internet. In 2014 alone, they filed more than 1,300 copyright infringement lawsuits in the United States. Defendant Pulisier used her Malibu Media business email to negotiate her personal loan terms with Genova. She used her personal emails to negotiate the consulting agreement with Warmblood, one of the investors. Pulisier runs Malibu Media in large part from her home. She intermingles funds, allegedly, that she receives from Genova and Warmblood with her personal funds and her business, allegedly. Checks were issued for $2.5 million on the personal promissory note. So that I think that means it was set up like a line of credit, like they had an account and then the line of credit was with the account and they could just write a check out of the account and then that becomes part of the money they owe and they can take up to 2.5 million. I think that's what that means. Allegedly, Defendant Field is the owner of Alter Ego Shell Entities, Click Here and Zoe Digital, both of which have no business purpose except to shield assets from creditors improperly, it says. According to the California Secretary of State website, both these entities share the same Mulholland business address, and the Mulholland address is the address of a home they once lived in. They are the owner of alter ego shell entities Colette Holdings, Colette Properties, Colette Productions, Inc., all of which have no business purpose except to improperly shield assets from creditors. Defendant Pellissier is the owner of Alter Ego Shell Entities Collect Productions LLC, which has no purpose except to improperly shield assets from creditors. 
Even beyond the defendant's shared contact information, management, and assets, the pure fact that many of the defendant entities are so similar in name to one another leads to the logical conclusion that these entities are carbon copies with a unity of interest in the same individual. What what are they doing here? Why are they saying all this stuff about shielding assets and all that? Well, what does a corporation do? A corporation acts as a separate entity from the people who run it, so that if the corporation goes under, those people aren't personally affected by it. But in order to get that protection, you need to observe the corporate form. You need to respect it legally. You need to complete the requirements of forming the corporation properly, maintaining the various duties as far as your duty to the corporation, you might have to have a board of directors in some entities, you have to pay your taxes, you have to maintain insurance for the expected liability of the company. If you just set up, and it's no problem to just go file an LLC, I think it's $125 in Pennsylvania, and you can just create a corporation or an LLC, a limited liability company or corporation. And that itself just registers it with the state. It doesn't actually mean you've obeyed the corporate form. So it's really easy to just make one of these things and then other people have to figure out whether you've done it properly or not. So if they're not observing the corporate form, then the liability protection doesn't kick in and they can be reached personally in a action that, or, or I don't know if the action is titled this, but the doctrine is called piercing the veil, piercing the corporate veil. So you're, you're piercing the, 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 you know, it's only a veil, it's a veneer. It's not a real piece of wood, it's just a veneer that makes it look like it's something else. So they pierce that and they get at your personal assets and personal liability. And so they start to list that these entities have assets that we've listed these before. So then they have a breach of contract action listed and nothing there is new that we haven't seen before. Same thing with the other breach of contract action. And so then they ask for compensatory consequential damages, 50% of net recoveries, net profits, etc., and then interest at 10% per year and costs. And since it's a contract action, what, what do we know about contract actions? You don't get things like punitive damages for contract actions. You get your economic damages plus your costs plus interests. That's really it. So I don't expect that they're going to receive extra, but they are. They should be able to get at the property or something. And we'll see what happens there. If someone can figure out the status of the real estate that we looked at there, that real estate is going to be the subject of this uh, recovery action. So you're watching the house of cards that is an adult entertainment company suing its best, its most, how do you say it? I, because they wouldn't call it their best fans, right? But these are people who truly love their content and they just have to figure out a way to monetize it to them. Instead, the way they figured out how to monetize it is by suing them, sometimes suing them into the ground. And now it turns out that the law firms that were behind it are getting screwed. And it turns out the investors that were behind it are getting screwed. And the people who actually conducted all of this are trying to get away scot-free. And hopefully they don't get away scot-free. I want to see now exactly how many Malibu Media actions have been filed since August 30th, right? So if I go into my... Uh, I can't show you my search system because I pay for it and it's $1,600 if I show you things. So let's see when the last Malibu Media case was filed. They have some new ones at the in the beginning of September and one, two, three, four, five in Illinois in October, on October 15th. And the next time it shows up is when they get sued by Lomnitzer January 9th. So they have filed literally six cases after, remember in 2014, they filed 1,300 cases. They've now filed six in the last approximately, what, uh, September, October, November, December, January. In the past five months or so, they've filed literally six cases. So how far has Malibu Media fallen? This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission 
at the links in the description below. In the month of January, thank you to our $50 plus supporters, Aspernari, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Michael Pierce, Jan Negray, Spirit Bear, Daniel Perez, Snorri Wizatsky, Blackleaf, Joe Tyson, Evie, Benjamin Hightoff, Steven, Cute Grills in Your Area, and Ada. I did see we have a new supporter, Kaisel, or I'll see if I can find out how that's pronounced. Thank you very much for your support. You will start appearing in the crawls at the beginning of February. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the screen in front of me and will appear in the description of the videos we drop. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you to Brandon and Tactical for contributing to the research we did today. I love you all. I will see you in the videos. Bye. I don't know what all those barriers are doing there. Maybe they're just decorations at this point. I think they're decorations because they're all like... Different sizes and colors. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and here's our station. All right. I'll get it. And you press, yeah. and you press the green button. And you, and you can get off right into the corrugated steel thing. <laughs> all right. And that's us.